My background's electrical engineering. It is not medicine. I got in the field because my wife became diabetic doing everything right. Type one in her 30s. So I spent a lot of time at the Houston Academy of Medicine. Uh, I live in Houston, Texas. We have the biggest cancer center in the world. They were nice enough to let me use their medical library. So after five years of physiology, biochemistry studying, it was my goodness, we're being told almost 180 degrees opposite from the physiology and biochemistry of what to do. So I'm going to give you a lot of science. I'm going to go relatively fast. How many here are familiar with my work? Have you read any of the journal articles? Okay, good amount. Good, excellent. Doesn't make any difference how smart you are, who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with real life results, it's wrong. It's all there is to it. Nobel Prize winner, Richard Feynman. More medical researchers should be forced to read that about a thousand times. Another big one, belief without understanding is stupidity. Mere generalized statements without sharp, specific conclusions are meaningless. When you read the end of all these journal articles, it typically ends up on, in particular with fish oil, we don't know the metabolic pathways that got this result. Well, that is not acceptable. You better know the metabolic pathways. I hate when physicians get misled because it happens all the time. Studies aren't science. Everybody I'm talking to, including the medical students, act like there's no physiology and no biochemistry. And it's like we need a study to show us where to go. No. Study should be used to confirm the established physiology and biochemistry. So when I was at MIT in engineering, one of the first rules is you should always have an idea where things are going. If I throw something off the roof of the hotel, I know it's going to hit the ground and not go off to the sun. I would predict that. So you could say, oh, that's a bias. And that's fine in science. There's always a bias. You just have to be truthful if your bias fails and it didn't come out the way you thought. You have to tell people that. That doesn't happen in fish oil. I had no vengeance against fish oil, by the way. I specialize in essential fatty acids, which are the parent oils. And I'll tell you, in fish oil, there's 15,000 studies. There may be two things. Why so many? You have a couple on gravity. You know, it goes towards the bottom. It doesn't go towards the top. Maybe two or three. You don't have 15,000. And out of those 15,000, the vast majority fail. You're not told that. So experiments are critical where you vary one thing and one thing only. Associations are next to worthless. That's epidemiology. Example would be I get up at 6 a.m., you get up at 6 a.m., the sun arises at 6 a.m., you're associated with the sun arising. Okay. Now the real experiment would be, okay, get her up at 7 a.m., get her up at 8 p.m., and again, you're up at 8, 8 a.m., the sun is already up there. It had nothing to do with you. So you have to be very, very careful with associations. Unfortunately, today, most journal articles are not worth the paper they're printed on. I used to read about 600 a week on the abstracts. Publishing has become an end in itself. It's tragic. It did not used to be this way. When you look at the top people like Einstein, five journal articles. Feynman, five. When you have people having hundreds with their name on it, the question you should ask is, what did this lead to? And it's typically nothing. It's just another journal article, because you have 200 and you have 400, so you're doubly as good as you. It's meaningless. It's the quality. Confusion at best, deception probably. Big thing that I want you to understand is probability and statistics, there's relative risk and there's absolute risk. What you always see in the journals is 37% less risk of getting a cardiovascular event. Now, if you think that means 37% less risk to each patient in your office, you've been highly misled. It doesn't mean that. And here's why. What's the difference between two out of a million and one out of a million? You have two successes with the intervention. You have one success with the placebo. Both cases is next to zero except if you were part of the pharmaceutical industry, it'd be 50% success, right? Get rid of the sample size of the million, and it's one verse two. That's 50%. Although no honest scientist would say that's correct, that's what you see. So that's a relative risk. Relative risk is trend only. When you see 30% better, 40%, 50, that should get your attention, but that's it. You need to know the sample size in the article, and pharma will never give it to you. 
What you want is the absolute risk. That is your patient's risk. And here's the difference. Two out of a million versus one out of a million is essentially zero. There's something called NNT. That means number needed to treat. As all of you know, how many do I have to treat to see one positive outcome? Well, the NNT of this would be a million. It means I treat a million people, I get one positive outcome. Farmer would have you believe it's two. The NNT would be two. I treat two people, I get a positive outcome. That's absolutely wrong, and you can tell intuitively because two out of 100 versus one out of 100 can't be the same as two out of 1,000 compared to one out of 1,000, or two out of 10,000 versus one out of 10,000. Farm would have you believe they're 50%, so these studies do that. That's all relative risk. It's highly misleading. And this is where you got with, for example, Lipitor, 36% effectiveness rate. Well, it's actually 1%. The NNT of uh, statin is about 100, which means I treat 100 people. I get one positive result, and that's over five years. That doesn't take into account side effects, by the way. You have to ask yourself the question, is cardiologist offices 36% empty since statins came on board? Of course not. They're overflowing. So, again, probability and statistics isn't what physicians should be spending their time on. But what I want you to get out of this is when you read that journal article and you see a percentage, that's a relative risk. It is not your patient's success rate. Now it's immunity. Maximum immunity requires full physiologic EFA cellular functionality. There's two types of EFA. It stands for essential fatty acid. Essential means got to get them from food. Body can't make them. You have parent omega-3, that's ALA, parent omega-6, that's LA. Linoleic acid, alpha linolenic acid, those are the terms. Bottom line is you need both from food. And the number one thing I want everybody to get out of this presentation so omega-6 is 100 times more critical than omega-3. Okay, you're going to get that from this. You have 100 trillion cells. Half of every cell is fat. The other half is protein. Out of the 50% fat, 25 to 33% are parent omega-6 and parent omega-3. And when you look at the tissue ratios and all the tissues in the body, you need 11 times more parent omega-6 than omega-3. Because everybody says, oh, we're getting overdosed with omega-6. No, you're not. You need 11 times more than the omega-3. And most of the omega-6 is adulterated. When you're looking at long-chain metabolites, I call them derivatives. It's also in the literature. EPA, DHA from fish oil is not an EFA. They all use the wrong term. I got so sick and tired of seeing EFAs being long-chain metabolites. That's not true because they're not essential. Your body's job is to make the long chain metabolites, GLA, EPA, DHA, AA, from the parent oils. 